One second. Okay. Hi, this is our first regular brown bag. I'll deal with this echo in a second. <laughs> Please, I have Glennis Farrar, uh, who's going to tell us about G minus two. That's it. That's the whole introduction. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, it's really so exciting after such a long time of, of being defeated in population of system and cultures that I'm excited to see a lot of people I don't know yet. So stop by and then I need to before I see on sabbatical this semester, so a lower profile than usual, but so often here. And I was so sorry to miss this last time. It was unexpected generally the discipline. Um, had I had the opportunity to talk about that then, I wouldn't have talked about this because I know I was going to get to talk about it today. What I would have mentioned, though, is that I also work on uh, the magnetic field of the galaxy, which is, uh, I don't want to heat it up, but anyway, it's a really exciting moment for that, as well as all kinds of cosmic rays and dark matter, which is highly associated with this. So come and see me, and I have a lot of fun. Um, um, today I'm going to talk about G minus two, and in the spirit of brown bag, I'm going to assume that um, half of you know, or twenty percent of you know more about it than me, and uh, some of you know nothing about it. <laughs> There's a lot of the First, I'll tell you what G minus two is, and so my uh, order of business to help remind us all is first I'll tell you what the G minus two problem is. I'll outline the standard model calculation, and it uses something called the R ratio, which I'll explain about. And then I'll. Um, Talk about the lattice gauge. And I'm sorry, I feel like I can't write very well. So this, if it's too ill, if it's too illegible, just tell me. Is so that what the pandemic took from you, Glennis? <laughs> Among other things, it, it didn't only take from me though. It added about five pounds. <laughs> Not that that was <laughs> Sad to say. <laughs> okay, and then I'm going to talk about measuring. The R ratio, which is this crucial experimental quantity that goes into the standard model prediction. And then the sort of highlight of the subject uh, of, the top, of the top. The reason I'm giving the talk is that I'm going to claim that there may be missed final states in the measurement. And so I'll show you that the it would be natural for us to be missing final states of the right magnitude. To fix the step I, I mean, I guess it's, if you have not been in a hole, you know there's a 4.2 sigma deviation between the standard, the experimental measurement and the particle physics standard model prediction. This is one of the most exciting things going on. When you last talked about G minus two, didn't you also say that there was a discrepancy between experiment and experiment? Oh, I'll come to that. It's, will, okay. it's not experiment and experiment, but it's between experiment and minus two C D. Okay, fine. Um, so it's naturally of the right magnitude, and then the question is how could there be anything uh, how could we have missed it? I mean, it, it is astounding if this is correct, that there's a whole world out there that we don't know about. And what could they be? And then experimental tests of this proposal, which are already going on, already going on. You can imagine experimentalists uh, who have measured this are really excited about this uh, And then if there's time, and I hope there may be as astrophysical and possible astrophysics and cosmological consequences, 
of there being uh, particles we don't know about. Okay, so g minus two. Put that up there. Oh, where should I put the pictures of g minus two? Maybe I'll put them. There. Or I'll start uh, reminding you that classically, if you have a spinning bunch of charge with some angular momentum and spinning here, then the magnetic moment, if the charge is E, well, if it's a negative particle by definition, we define it this way. So that's classically. And conveniently, that's assuming the uh, distribution of charge is the same as the distribution of mass. That's why the um, moments of inertia don't kind of cancel out. So in quantum mechanics, because L becomes um, a spin in the case of a point particle like the, or a particle like the, an elementary particle is what I want to say, like the uh, electron or the muon or something. Um, the angular momentum is, is the spin angular momentum. The fundamental magnetic moment is associated with the spin angular momentum and is quantized. And so that means that the relevant U is minus G times UBS. And U sub B, the B stands for Bohr, is E h bar over 2m. Um, and the co convention, so I just, if you just substitute this and this, you get that. And the convention is to write g as 2 times 1 plus a. And if I'm talking about the muon, as I am today, I would do this, and it would be the muon mass. And Bohr was thinking about the electron mass, and didn't know about muons in those days. And uh, but for each particle has its own Bohr magnet size. So the proton uh, magnetic moment uh, has a known, uh, <coughs> the magnetic moment of the proton is an important measurement of it. Anyway, this a mu, the mu is not a Lorentz index, it's just a designation that is for the muon, is the anomalous um, magnetic moment of the muon. The two in here was, of course, the triumph of Dirac in quantum mechanics. Um, so then quantum field theory. Actually, can I interrupt you on that yes. point? <clears throat> in classically, it being two would mean something weird about the, the, rate, the distribution of charge relative to mass, right? I, have, I think that someone can correct me. The prediction may have preceded the measurement. That doesn't seem plausible, does it? OK, my history is bad. So I don't know what people thought about that. Um, people, re you know, when you read about it, um, they talk about this being a triumph, uh, which doesn't make it clearly could be a triumph, whether it's a prediction or not, mm -hmm. in any event. Um, OK, so in quantum field theory, which is where uh, we become interesting, the, Let's, set, let's focus in on the muon for a reason I'll come back to. So this is a photon, it's a quantum of the magnetic field. Um, and then this is a muon. And, and so the reading order, uh, that's the Feynman diagram. And in this vertex, you, I won't go into the calculation, but anyway, uh, you just put the electric charge in and you will get that. Now at higher order, you add corrections, and so one correction is just a photon exchange. And another correction at the same order would be a photon exchange on all the different legs and so on. You can imagine that the, as you go to higher and higher order, uh, the number of diagrams really proliferates. It would be, I should have thought to look up the number of diagrams that are needed in the calculation to present day accuracy. But I, it's, it's surely in the hundreds of millions. Um, anyway, these ones are very straightforward uh, because we really know quantum electron dynamics very well. And so the next term, and all of the other places of an assertion, uh, you have a loop of charged fermions. So this would be electrons 
neurons themselves. And the problem in the standard model comes because it also includes all the quarks. So there's the up quark and the down quark and the strange quark. And you might say, yes, well, why is that a problem? We know QCD is a fundamental theory. We surely believe that. Uh, and so we just do the calculation. The problem is you can't calculate this accurately, perturbatively, except when the momentum going through here is extremely large. If I were to expand this diagram, um, what would be going on, here's my loop, I'm going to write it this way to be suggestive in a minute. Um, there would be, this is let's say a quark and an anti-quark, well there would be a diagram with Quark and an ant going this way, completed over here, and I don't know why I drew it not dash at the sort of thing. And so where this would be a pi, pi minus, let's say. And then there would be other diagrams with quarks coming out here with maybe an extra pi zero, and so on. And so there's a proliferation of very strongly interacting um, particles. Theoretical physics to the rescue, however. Um, it turns out you can, theoretical experimental physics to the rescue, is that you can represent this thing that you need. So this piece, when these are hadrons, and it's trivial, or not trivial, of course, it's a hard calculation, but still it's conceptually clear cut if this is just leptons, but when these are the quarks, um, then it becomes very non trivial. That piece of the entire calculation is called the hadronic vacuum polarization. It is far and away the dominant uncertainty in the standard model prediction. Um, there's another diagram that people used to worry about called light by light, which is still higher order, where you have a bunch of hadronic interactions and four photons. And then that connects to the muon. But that's uh, a very much smaller contribution. And in fact, it's a negligible compared to this. It's, and it's uncertainty is not very big. <coughs> Mainly could just because it's so small, a small contribution. OK, so how do we calculate this? There's a marvelous uh, result. Oh. I wanted to sketch to you, for you, I will do it, and then, I'm sorry, I interrupted, but I don't to interrupt, I guess. I wanted to just remind you, before I got off into this calculation, um, I wanted to remind you how people measure G minus 2. And so basically the idea is you have a constant magnetic field, and you have a muon uh, circulating around it. And the uh, cool thing is that the rate of precession of the muon spin, if the moment, magnetic moment were two, it would exactly equal the cyclotron frequency. Um, and so you can measure pretty straightforwardly the deviation, well, uh -huh, nothing straightforward, of course, the deviation, um, which is called the anomalous precession, and it's the uh, Perception that you actually observe minus or, or, with, <coughs> I don't know, I call this, I'll call zero, minus the cyclotron contribution. Is, is just proportional to a mu times b. And then there are other terms that the experimentalists have to struggle with. So this would come from NA. It's simple if the if the field is exactly perpendicular to the motion, then this vanishes. And then there's another term that comes if there's a um, electric field around, which of course there is because it's an accelerator. Um, but it should be orthogonal to make this go away. So you can imagine the experimental thing is a nightmare. The precision 
that they have on the value of a mu that you can extract from this is 0 0.25 parts per million. Um, you might wonder why don't people use the, elect the magnetic moment, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, and the answer is that the um, anomalous moment of the electron, well, what should I say, the contribution of heavy particles in these loops for the electron, it goes like the, it's proportional to the mass. So the muons, the heavy particle contributions go like the squared, which is about 410 to the fourth. And I should have also said the reason particle theorists are so excited about this, is mostly, is because if you go to, if there's some new physics in the story, uh, sorry, I'm using that bad blackboard technique thing on these today. Um, like, uh, I think actually Pierre Fayet, I were, I were the first to do this, I'm not sure. We calculated the, of, of using G minus two for constraining new physics. We were looking at supersymmetry where there's a muon, a scalar muon, and it would add an additional diagram with a neutralino, say a photino, I call it just some of those. So this is analogous to this diagram, but doing the supersymmetric substitution. So diagrams like that can make a big difference, and they make a much bigger difference in general for the muon than the electron. So even though the muon precision is about um, three orders of magnitude worse than for the electron, it's the one that's most sensitive to new physics. So why don't people use the tau? If the case to best. <coughs> the muon decays in about 10 to minus 8 seconds, <coughs> they, you can keep it circulating in a beam test. I see. And this part, this, you basically, my order of magnitude feeling is that if you're measuring something part per million, you need it to do a million orbits. Oh, they have very many more than a million orbits, and they have a very large number of new lines and lines that are quite a high intensity. It's a very wonderful story in itself. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the Discrepancy, I call it delta <laughs> ring. Um, how to describe this? The standard model, I'll just write it this way, is in these units 25.1 uh, plus or minus 5.9 times 10 to the minus 10. <laughs> it's stunning, isn't it, that the precision of the measurement is so good. But anyway, this is 4.2 sigma. Well, this by itself may not be 4.2 sigma, but there's another experiment and combined. This one is, a, the new one is from 2001, is the most accurate, but together they're 4.2 sigma. What is this, this point 35 parts per million? Oh, I'm just saying that the, I'm um, sorry, this is the delta <clears throat> AMU. Or I wish I, uh, this is the sort of sigma. If you, if I translate this, if I, um, well, if you put 5.9 into parts per million, it will be... Yeah. Okay. Without having a better feel for the magnitude of this thing. And the numbers, when you read papers, they, they start out 11, and then they go on with 10 digits. So it's a little hard to... That's why I'm not writing out the actual values of everything. Okay. All right, so then the question becomes... Uh, Sorry, I don't understand that. Because AMU is one, so if I put it into, into parts per million, it will be five nine zero parts no, per AMU million. No, AMU is zero. Sorry, what if I done? This is the deviation yeah. Yeah. between the experimental value and the prediction value, and it's this yeah. number is multiplied by ten to the minus. But this is five nine zero parts per million, right? No, it's 5.9, 10 to the minus 10. Because I haven't value. told you, I haven't told you what the whole thing is. Here the whole thing is you. one. Yes. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. No, no, no. In these units, it's... Well, it's deviation from standard yeah. model or something? Yeah, I'm just reporting the deviation. Okay. I should have just written the whole thing out. So the standard model in you, if you want to say what the standard model in you is. It's like, I, but I can't remember the number. It starts off 11, 11, 0, 5, 9, blah, 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 blah. 10 to the minus 10. Oh, alpha over 2 pi, right? The right, right. It's like Schwinger, right? So it is whatever. Yeah, that's right. If you can remember. Right, right, I, right. I was, right. Okay. 
We're focused on So this is deviation from Schwinger's result. When you it's put it into Schwinger, parts per right, million. And, and it's, it's the total deviation. And it, it looks like it's going to be in this definition, Schwinger is already in a mu. Right, right, right. Okay. So he ca Schwinger calculated the first correction to a mu. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, next thing I want to talk about is <clears throat> this list. I somehow changed the order for some. Oh, no, I didn't. This, so I've told you how you would calculate this in the standard model, but I haven't yet told you. Uh, I apologize. I definitely have gotten a little off track. Let me reorient myself. Um, I told you what the experiment is and that there's this discrepancy and why it's of interest in um, for, for particle physicists because of this possibility that there's some discrepancy that's revealing new physics. Um, the now what I want to talk about is the make up my mind. I guess I'm going to talk about the uh, no, I want to, now I remember my plan. Um, this picture here <coughs> suggests a strategy uh, for calculating it theoretically. But we're not really calculating it theoretically. We can't calculate it, but inferring it theoretically. And the statement is that you can show that this hadronic vacuum polarization piece, it's a sum up over all sorts of final states, you can relate it to the total cross-section for E plus E minus annihilation. So if you were calculating E plus E minus annihilation, <coughs> that also goes through a quark and an antiquark. And so you would have all of these final states here in the hadrons. And so the statement is that if you square this thing, which sort of diagrammatically corresponds to sewing on this inverted piece, um, then this would tell you the information you want. And so there's a quantity called the R ratio, which is defined to be the total cross-section for E plus E minus goes to hadrons divided by the cross-section for E plus E minus goes to muons at leading order. At some given, S is, symbolizes the center of mass energy of the E plus and E minus squared. Um, visually, you can see that that kind of an interesting quantity, right? Because the thing in the denominator, modulo a difference in charge of the charges of the quarks are one third and two thirds, and the charge of muon is one. But apart from that, the loop that you're sort of is driving the whole thing is the same in the two cases. Having defined this thing, and this is measurable in principle because people do experiments measuring this. Um, so if you've measured this, what's very beautiful is that these two can be related, and this contribution is alpha, and that's just the fine structure constant, divided by the integral over s times this quantity r of s divided by s times k of s, where k of s is a known function. It's derived theoretically. It comes from uh, Basically, it derives from the fact that in this loop integral, because of the, all of these propagators, the weight of this is not just one, um, but it's a known function. And just because it's useful to keep in mind that it's some factors, more or less, this uh, R of S over S squared. The reason for mentioning this is to call your attention to the fact that having a change in R of S at very large S will make a very much smaller contribution to the hadronic vacuum polarization than a change uh, at much lower S. So, yeah. so when you measure this R ratio, how do you separate the muon 
fronds and hadrons? The muons separating from the hadrons is the easy part mm -hmm. because muons have, uh, first of all, they have, well, I'll, I'll get to the experiments a little bit and I'll make a point of addressing that when I get to it. Very naive question, which maybe is idiotic, but but um, if you're measuring this, you're measuring free hadrons, right? And over there, they're virtual hadrons. And it, why is it the same? It's because of the uh, well, it's, it's sort of a generalization of the optical theorem. But there's it's it's a, I I made it sort of sound plausible. It's hope, plausible, but exactly. <laughs> but it's it's a non-trivial. Uh, Okay, fine. Piece of part of theoretical. Okay, good. So, but I'm pleased to hear that isn't stupid. <laughs> no, <that's not. laughs> All right. Now, I want to show you the R ratio. Nope. Wrong slide. Wrong, wrong word. Um, oh, I actually have some. The R ratio, you really just look it up in the particle data book if you haven't. It's stupendous. Uh, the care with which it's measured. I mean, this of course is just my crummy sketch, but the error bars would be small compared to the line thickness. And this is the log of it, and up here the cross sections for rho and omega are like 10 millibar. And so millibar is, 10 millibar is a very typical hadronic cross section. This is not hadronic, of course, it is e plus e minus, but it's because there's a strong resonance here. So I just lay, and the Z boson, of course, you know, and then it's down here, and so it's many orders of magnitude change, and this is this quantity, yes. um, the center of mass energy, so this is around 100 GeV, so the B, and the, these are around 1 GeV, and then the J Psi are 3 GeV, and the Upsilon are is at about 10 GeV. So just to remind people who aren't following this, the rho and the omega are sort of, we think of them as bound states. A more accurate description would be to think of them as just literally resonances of, of like as predominantly the pi plus pi minus in the case of the rho. We think of them as being uh, elementary particles sort of themselves, unstable elementary particles made of like an up and a down, and a up quark or a down and any down quark. Or the phi meson is predominantly an SS bar uh, resonance. The omega is another one. So these low resonances are very wide because there's a lot of phase space. The pions are really small, and that's mostly what the low decays into. And then there's the J psi, which is made of CC bar, and it's got charm mesons, and the charm meson analog of this are the like the Psi 3770 and so on, that's why I drew a little bump there. And then the upsilon is the resonance of BB bar, and of course the Z is a, it's a, it's an elementary particle, but it's, it's very wide because it can decay into so many things. And so corresponding to that, you have the R ratio. And a thing to keep in mind is on the resonances, the peaks of the R ratios can get up to something like uh, 10 to the 3 in the R ratio. Um, and it's kind of to scale. I, I did make some printouts if people are interested. Um, a relevant thing to say is that when you do this calculation, something like 3 quarters of the mu, the hadronic vacuum polarization, is about 75, around 3 quarters, maybe 76%, due to the rho. And it's about 6% due to the phi. And the rest, it doesn't add up to 100%, is mainly due to the continuum, these higher resonances and, and the little bumps and so on. The deviation is about 3%. It's about one half. So delta A mu, let me call it. The, the discrepancy is about one half of the contribution of the phi. And that's what I'm going to point out, is that if there were some sort of final state such that it was hard for us to see, and it was in a new particle, it, you know, it was resonating, the size of the contribution is absolutely regular. It wouldn't, you wouldn't need to artificially inflate it or something like that. <coughs> okay, so 
Um, but how can you have hidden low energy resonance? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> ah, it's impossible. Well, that's what I have to answer. And so hopefully I've left myself enough time. To uh, okay. <laughs> um, so, yes. So maybe connecting to Andrea's question. So if you have like a whole tower of resonances with higher you know, energy or high masses, uh, will that also be a resolution? Well, Instead of one... the important part is that their contribution summed over them yes. as, as up to the thing. Up to thing. The, uh, yes. But um, because of this one over S squared, then um, the higher ones are sort of per resonance less effective. But you're actually right. It's I'm just going to talk as if there's a single one, okay. just for the sake of simplicity. But that translation is is virtually trivial. Mm -hmm. You just if you have two resonances, each of them has a half the contribution. Yes. Um, well, what what things have I forgotten so far? Seemingly nothing yet. Okay, but what about the lattice? Because lattice gauge theory has made tremendous progress, and now they can calculate it. For years and years, there was no good standard model prediction, because you can't do it except by lattice gauge theory, because it involves a strong interaction, and the lattice gauge calculations weren't good enough uh, yet. Um, I brought a picture for the lattice gauge part. Um, so what they do in lattice gauge calculations, if you imagine a four-dimensional lattice, there's two more dimensions hidden in the blackboard. Uh, this is schematically spaced, and this is what's called Euclidean time, because they calculate in Euclidean time. Uh, what they do is they put in a source for a current <coughs> corresponding to this. And then over here, at some later Euclidean time, they extract that and they look for a correlated signal. It's extremely complex because on the lattice, you, you, it's hard to represent fermions, and so there are different techniques for representing fermions. You have to take the continuum limit and, and all sorts of things. And so it's been a pretty much of a tour de force. But at this point, uh, there are several experiments that are reporting results with small error bars. The same day that the G minus two was announced, a lattice gauge experiment claimed uh, called the BMW collaboration for, uh, well, I'm not gonna try to remember what it stands for. <laughs> it's a European group. Um, they announced that they had a 3.9 sigma deviation in the direction that would cure or reduce the standard model uh, prediction. So the statement is, when they calculated the, this, this hydronic vacuum polarization, it was bigger than the experimental amount by enough that were they to use their answer, there would be no significant discrimination. So um, let me tell you a little bit about those calculations. It's pretty hard as, as you separate the, as you make the, this time interval and you put the time longer and longer, you get more and more noise in your calculation and other artifacts are a problem. There's a sort of sweet spot. And of course, if it's, if it's too short, you're dominated by a discretization problem. There's sort of a, a sweet spot for the lattice calculations when they're most precise. Um, and so, this is in Euclidean time translated into Fermi. What the lattice people do, they they sort of divide it into windows, and they weight the result of their calculation for a given time by a different by they have different prescriptions that they can look into. And so, for example, they could in their instead of calculating the entire a mu, which would require weighting everything equally or with a specific, I won't go into those steps too much, they, they can calculate an alternative to a mu where they've like weighted their function with this extra window factor. If they had weighted it with this, they would be especially probing short distance effects. 
if they weighted it with that, they would be more sensitive to long distance effects, but it would be harder to calculate. And if they did this one here, which is the best for them to calculate, uh, they call that the, some of it, somebody just call it the window. Anyway, how you weight it translates into your sensitivity in uh, this center of mass energy. So this one, the short distance one, uh, if that was the window you used, it would be like you were calculating it, but with an extra weight in your R. So you would be weighting your R to really high energies. If you do the calculation, the lattice calculation with this window function, then it's as if you're weighting across the R with this weight. So it peaks around, I didn't draw it terribly well, it's around 1.5 that it peaks. And then it sort of tails off at high energies. Or if you weighted it with this one here, I can't remember which one I started with. Anyway, anyway you get the picture. When they weight their, um, and their calculation, and compare it to the weighted experimental calculation. Then BMW found that the, the discrepancy, I, I'll call it a mu window, was 3.9 sigma. And then this, a few months ago, another group reported uh, their experiment, their lattice experiment, and a reanalysis of the other lattice experiments. And when you do all of that, the present discrepancy in the lattice compare. Now this is comparing it to the um, the e plus e plus e minus vacuum polarization. So this is not comparing to g minus two. It's comparing instead directly to e plus e minus data. If you say there weren't new physics in g minus two, then this would be equivalent essentially because essentially the only uncertainty in g minus two. And if you use, so basically the statement is that if you use the lattice instead of um, the experimental R ratio, you would, um, wouldn't have a g minus two discrepancy that was worth mentioning, it would be less than one sigma. So, so the, the 3.9 sigma discrepancy here is between lattice and standard model. Between lattice and e plus e minus in this. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, there are too many different ones. So the, the confusion is that when people refer to the standard model prediction, really it's testing this method of going from the e plus e minus data to the prediction. And so. Right. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Because, yeah. because that's absolutely dominant, the uncertainty. Right. Um, lattice. Do you know what the leading source of error is at long Euclidean time? At, at long Euclidean time, what's the leading source of error on the lattice? I, I think it's sort of competitively both statistical and some kind of a spin artifact. Um, I have the, a good paper on it, though, to share, and we can talk about it. In different regimes, there are different sources, but I, and I wouldn't trust myself, except to say that the statistical error is certainly amongst them. Um, well, it's a really interesting situation. Um, for those of us who find hadrons really interesting, uh, you know, it stimulates the imagination. Um, I should say that if... Have they identified the origin of this thing? Because you said it's due to individual particles. Does it mean that they have discovered a new particle or whatever? Well, let me uh, now come to that. Or is it just a black box? Let me come to that. Yes, as far as the... Uh -huh. Okay, so let me... I'm so excited. I'm forgetting to tell you that. Comment one is that the lattice gauge theory discrepancy with E plus and minus totally into... So G minus two discrepancy could come from new physics or not getting the hadronic vacuum polarization right. Lattice gauge theory, the only explanation is either that the E plus E minus experiments are wrong or that they, there's lattice gauge theory problems, but now with three different experiments, similar 
uh, precision all in agreement. And by the way, they now do their uh, studies blind. It's really so impressive. Uh, there was one paper that came out recently talking about it's, you know, more accurately experimentally weighting this from a group that was anticipating it. And they were saying, but we can't actually tell you what we get because it's still blinded. <laughs> um, so that's one point to say. The only resolution, if you want to resolve also the lattice gauge theory calculation with the experiment, is if it's uh, something hadronic. Because the only thing that goes into the lattice gauge calculation is hadronic. Um, I should also say, and this is the question I think that was raised, would it make sense that you would discover, supposing there were new particles, I'm jumping ahead of the game again, but maybe from there. I know you know. Anyway, a very reasonable explanation is that they're long-lived neutral hadrons, maybe just one, I'll call it X, X bar, maybe there's a, several of them. In any event, if there are long-lived neutral hadrons that haven't been discovered yet, I will show you that they would have not been detected in the experiments. There's a, like a blind spot in the experiments that I'm now going to talk about which is why they wouldn't have been detected. You could say, why wouldn't they have already been detected in the, in the lattice experiments? And the answer to that is very much like, um, you could even argue it's exactly like, the fact that we can very precisely uh, predict deep and elastic scattering using QCD, whereas we couldn't possibly predict the cross-section for some final state. In a similar way, being able to source and then find evidence for a particular new state, you have to have a theory or an idea of what should be the right source for that state. And if it was a state you hadn't thought about, you wouldn't have done that. But do they see rho and phi, this oh, resonance is in, yeah, in yeah. lattice? Yes. And, but, and yet you are saying your hypothetical particle will be invisible. To <clears throat> because you have to put the right source in for it in your lattice study, if you're trying to see only that one particle. But if you're summing up over everything, this presence will be felt. Even just like in deep and elastic scattering, where you sum over everything, your calculation will properly include it. I could give a bunch of other Wait, examples. Are you, are you saying that the lattice, exper the lattice experiment, the simulation, could have this particle in it. It will. Without them having noticed, the, noticed it as a separate thing. Exactly. Exactly. Right. If according to it's a little in the example of deep and elastic scattering, I don't know how familiar you may be with that, is exactly like that. The um, summation, right? Theory can use unitarity to sum. I mean a properly done theory, that's there. Whereas Isolating individual particles is a very much more challenging thing. Okay, so let me move to why um, this would have, uh, new particles would have, could have been this. And let me say first, why a neutral long lived hadron? Well, hadron because otherwise it wouldn't explain uh, the matter spatial. Neutral because surely we know all the charged particles, right? Particles get produced if they were produced at a level of half the phi meson and decaying to, and decaying to charged particles, um, we would see the charged particles. Particle physics detectors are perfect at seeing charged particles. Um, if they're neutral, then they won't necessarily be seen because most of the charge tracking uh, is looking for, if we can go into this one more, certainly the decay into charged particles is usually as a sort of a predominant way you can identify neutral particles if they decay to photons, and you can identify them if they scatter. Then you would see the um, sort of the recoil of the scatter. Like scatter in the strong sector, in the Q Yeah, that's right. So like a neutron going along can see a nucleus, and it can just scatter, and it can make a little shower, depending on how much energy it has. Um, so if it's neutral and it decays, like, for example, um, a charm, a D0 meson is a charm meson 
with a fairly long lifetime. Oh, I don't know what it's too short for this example. Um, a K0 meson or, uh, uh, would, has a lifetime around 10 to the minus 8 seconds, the, the long-lived one. Um, and what they do is they so you in your detector, you see nothing, nothing, nothing. If here's the interaction where the particles uh, made, I'll, I'll give the example of K-long, and then it decays to, say, I plus I minus, or mu nu, or something like that. So what happens is, you, you see the thing after it decays, and so this is called a displaced vertex, and that's how they measure the lifetime of the B mesons and so on and so on. So a particle that decays into charged particles is also susceptible to being seen if it does it inside any detector. See that the past estimate, and I'd be really interested in working on this systematically with anyone who wants, is what general statements can you make about non-detect, what are the limits on lifetime for non-detection? I believe 10 to the minus seven seconds or longer is very safe. Maybe a lifetime of 10 to the minus eight would have evaded detection when you consider boost factors and stuff. But in any event, the right, like, it, relativistic particle moves at um, a foot in nanosecond, and so 10 to the minus seven seconds, a neutral particle, even if it decays, is way outside the detector even without a relativistic boost. But there's another, so lifetime is an important factor, but also just the QCD cross-section is important because the neutrons would be, neutrons are easy to see exactly. and they are very long-lived. Absolutely, and, and there's a huge abundance of them. Exactly. So as long as the, uh, thank you very much oh, for the nice thing, the, the reason you wouldn't expect to find a new neutral particle like at the LHC, um, there are gazillions of them being produced if it's a hadron, but there's even more gazillions by a factor of 300 or several thousand neutrons. And neutrons, you know, people just ignore them. They, if you look at your detector, <coughs> occasionally they'll have a little recoil. There'll be a little noise in the detector, but you know, so a systematic search is needed. Um, why would not they have been discovered? In the plus and minus experiments, so let me address that. What's well, sort of implicit in this? If there's an empty window in here. Oh, or maybe I'll just draw the picture here. Um, the, a typical collider, so there's two really active colliders now the Beijing electron synchrotron, which um, it's looking in the range for sort of two to five GeV center of mass energy. And there's a new detector called Bell 2, um, the KEK, and it's focused mainly on 10 GeV. There was an experiment that's over, but they're still doing very excellent data analysis called BABAR, and it's also a 10 GeV. And, and Bell 2 is having some issues, it turns out, with uh, too much background and things like that. So actually, adherents of L2 are fighting their teeth. Anyhow, um, and then there are a whole lot of earth, other earth, earlier experiments. But generally, the way they're made is something like this. It's not that different from what you would be used to seeing for the um, LHC. And, 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 and these two experiments are asymmetric, which is very nice, because then the particles or get boosted in the center of mass. And the B uh, is, is just symmetric. But conceptually, I, I'm just gonna keep it simple. And then they often have detectors here uh, for particles that come off forward. And then they usually have a giant calorimeter, electromagnetic calorimeter. These, these, these lines were meant to signify a detector that measures charge tracks. Anyway, um, the key thing to know in uh, well, which experiment was it? I'm going to forget which experiment it was, but um, one of the primary experiments, the signal, the, the event rate is 65 per second for things like mu plus, mu minus, um, and, uh, and hadrons. 
you might say everything you wanted or interested in, is something like 500 hertz for um, baba, baba scattering. So already a factor of 10 bigger. And then this is a, a anchor, something like 20 kilohertz for beam gas. This was actually an earlier experiment than any of these. And as the experiments have become more powerful, they have very much more intense beams. This, this increases um, sort of modestly, but these increase just hugely. And so what was the last thing I didn't catch it? Beam, oh, I call beam gas and other beam related stuff that has nothing to do with things like the beam, uh, well, just the vacuum's not perfect, so that's the dominant thing, but also clipping the edge of a... So detectors fire, but it has nothing to do with scatter. Exactly. Okay. And so, and, and you can see that the, this ratio is so huge. It's 300 times as much background, and I didn't know if I take right or maybe more. 3,000 times, um, some large number. Um, and so they have to very severely make event selection and trigger requirements. So I went through all of the papers. It's quite painful because it's so detailed. And it's clear that basically, unless there's a charged particle pair, that's one way it can be detected, or the, there's a lot of energy deposit and it's symmetric on the two sides, which it wouldn't be if you're making a particle, two particles and they're neutral, one happens to scatter and the other doesn't, and so on. So um, for sure, a process that's analogous to this, where you have um, where you have, for example, E plus E minus, which annihilates into a photon, all of these super big contributions come from a vector meson resonance, which has the same quantum numbers as the photon. So you can have a diagram like this, and then this decays. And it's, it's, it's a bright Wigner. So it's very easy to do this calculation. And, and I've done it, and that's how I check that the uh, for mass in this uh, in this range, so this this range of say one to four GeV, uh, the character of of the this process would just be completely routine. You can sort of see it without even doing a calculation, just on the example of the phi. Um, and yet, those electron I, I know nothing, of course, but this electron colliders can they see rho and phi? In they, the cross section, they, oh, absolutely. That's where these right. Uh, this is the cross from. section, and yes, yet exactly. your particle will not be seen there because as a feature in the cross. And they won't have kept if the final particles are neutral and uh, you know, rho and phi are neutral. No, no, but they're decay. They de the rho and phi decay until the minus 20 seconds. Ah, your, your thing should be long lived, and it's then the, it will the not products, be. It's the products of this thing, these ones, uh, which would be. The neutral long particles. Um, well, the two candidates that I know of uh, for what X could be, the sort of totally routine one is that there could be a new bound state. The tricky part is how to make a long lived hadron. The only long lived hadrons we know are protons and neutrons, basically. And they are long lived because they've got three quarks and there's no invariant numbers conserved and there's nothing lighter. And so they're stuck. They can't decay. Well, the neutron, of course, can decay to the proton. But um, in general, in order to make something long lived, right of weak decay is 10 to the minus 8 seconds. And this needs to be um, at least that long lived. Um, and it's hard to make a. a well, in any event, there's two ways conceivably could be done. So one one candidate, sorry, I've changed my topic. <laughs> one candidate is the sex accord that you've heard me talking about um, in the past in connection with dark matter, because it's an excellent dark matter candidate. It's, it's uh, mass is quite constrained um, between um, 
1.85 to 2. Point, well, generally speaking, it could be up to 2.25 uh, if it's lifetime is 10 to the minus 7. If it was dark matter, it could be up to about 2.05. And that's just a bound state of quarks, and the, it's a completely regular kind of a situation. Um, it would, it's curious that something like that would not have been seen. Experiments would be blind to that. I've talked about that in the past. Yeah. So, again, like, how is this calculator? Because just sort of naively looking at like a proton, right? If we just look at the quark content, it's like a factor a hundred heavier, right? And here, oh, like, no, 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 there's no. This much is less than this. A, proton, a proton's mass is 0.938 GeV. Yes. So this this upper number is the mass of twice the mass of a lambda, which is the a, a standard model known particle with a lifetime of 10 to minus eight seconds, whose uh, quark composition is the same. So it's as if 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 the mass of this were high enough, if it was really high, it would just decay to two lambdas. Sure. But if it's bound relative to the two lambdas, then it could be stable. If it's in this regime, you would expect it to have a weak interaction lifetime, like 10 to the minus. I'm oh, sorry, up to here. Above this, I make it. That's two lambdas. And then. 0.05 is a lambda plus a neutron, and then 1.85. Below this, the deuteron decays. And we know that neutron, deuteron doesn't decay. So this is the range, and, and, and above in this range, its lifetime is much less greater than the age of the universe, because it's a doubly weak decay. So the constraint this, isn't from a, this constraint isn't from a calculation, it's from it can't exist if it's outside this range. It, 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 we've already excluded yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, right. And so it's a fairly narrow mass range, extremely interesting um, in terms of these experiments. And then another one that I'm very uh, enamored of, uh, it's for theorists, it would be far and away the most exciting, I guess. This is just sort of a boring question of how tightly bound are these quarks is that it's some sort of topologically stabilized. I have a couple of ideas about it and would be happy to talk with anybody. But you know, you've, that's not believed to be possible in QCT, but there are other theories. But the general picture is that if you had a soliton which was pinned to some vacuum value on two sides, then it couldn't decay, although you could have two of them annihilate if you had one like that and one like that, and so on. So if there could possibly be some way QCD could, you know, the manifolds and, and guts are like this. Um, that would be extremely cool if there was a completely new kind of hadronic state. But anyway, this one is a nice, uh, a nice candidate. I, think I, I think I know the answer to this, but why don't people just compute that thing on the lattice? Well, they're trying to, but there's two, several problems. Um, the noise at large time grows like a double exponential as a number of quarks, so it's much, much harder. Um, and as my understanding is that even the proton is a hard calculation on the lattice, but I don't know what the status of that is Today, now. a proton is not a hard calculation. So they do get the proton correct now. Well, they, <laughs> there are a few things that fix the scale of the lattice. And Classically, one of the baryon masses is one of those. I mean, what, I see, I see. what so people use fine. to fix the scale. But the relative fine. masses are okay, excellent. Fine, yeah. okay, good, but fine. they're now calculating things like petachord masses or trying. Those are hard for the same problem. Um, I see. Let me just advertise that there's probably more things I would have liked to have said that I'm running over, I'm sure. Um, from the standpoint of cosmology and astrophysics, to me, it's really suggests interesting lines of work, and I would be so delighted if other people were interested. One is to write if it's a had if there is a neutral hadron and it's long enough lived to be the dark matter, then it would mean that it would be expected that uh, dark matter would have hadronic interactions. If the cross section of the dark matter 
baryon is of order n to the minus 27th or less, um, which is a sort of natural level, um, it won't have any problems with direct detection experiments, but it can have very good effects for cosmology and astrophysics, potentially. Um, one of them being that it can explain why, it naturally explains, it seems, why there are very supermassive early black holes. Because the, the problem with making early supermassive black holes is if you have some um, over density with a total mass of, say, 10 to the fifth solar masses, um, or 10 to the fifth, 10 to the seventh solar masses, without any extra form of heating, these collapse and just make ordinary stars, or stars that are 100 solar masses or something like that. To make a seed black hole, they have to be kept warm in order to get more and more dense. And so finally, they collapse as this very massive object. And I took some old papers that, where people have people worry about this. And so well, what if I added a dark matter baryon mass of this order? And it just seems cat's meow in terms of keeping the, uh, keeping the thing from collapsing until you start to get to the thistle mass. A very excellent project. Uh, which maybe some energetic student or postdoc would be interested, would be to add dark matter baryon cross-sections to a simulation code. Shai Ganell and Ben Weldent, when they'll want to do that with me, it would be super to have a person who wanted to, to take that on. The reason is that there are many, many places such an interaction could have an impact, and it's very hard to guess in some instances, some places are simple, like the, the seed black holes, but for many purposes, it's really hard to anticipate how it'll affect the usual story. And so you really need a simulation. But um, the reason it's much more challenging than just having dark matter interacting in its own sector, which is why that's what people mostly do. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So we have lots of questions, but but we have time for at least one more. There is. Maybe there's a couple. Yeah, I, oh, exactly. ask can, I won't be offended if anyone wants to do. Okay. <laughs> ago, it looked like it would be really a problem because hyperons seem to be a problem for neutron stars. And now we know that from we seeing very massive neutron stars, which are now known, that a quark matter core has to take over um, at a much lower density than those hadrons would be produced. So the answer is that had you asked the, a person, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, it would have seemed a problem. But now, we already know that um, it's not a problem. As soon as the mass is greater than 1.4 or 1.8 GB or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a peculiar way that it turns out not to be a problem. In a way, it would be such a big problem, and an even bigger problem for known hyperons, that we already know that the interior of neutron stars has to be quark matter or we could exclude it because we know they're hyperized. So it's a sort of odd circular thing. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I feel confused about how it can affect us so dramatically. So it's a, <coughs> you produce it in pairs, right? You produce your S particle in pairs, and naively it would be produced much, much less than the phi. Yeah. And you need like half of the phi. So well, I, I don't know why you say it would be naively. Oh, just yes. because you have to produce it in pairs, first of all, and, and just we know that getting out so many quarks and antiquarks from the vacuum is probably suppressed compared well, to... Well, 
we know that producing bar producing bion is already I'm thinking perturbatively if you what um, no we know from the Shen data Shen we know Shen from Shen the data that bions are about 10 percent of it's, hydrons it's because, already uh Chen did the following nice study yeah um namely imagine that you have uh two particles like you know like like the sexopore but it's a more general result than just with sexopore um do they have a P wave resonance at what level? And the answer is yes. And the minute you get a P wave resonance, then right, the, it's the resonance aspect, for example, or, or it also is possible they're produced along with other particles. I, certainly, I would think through this, because of the... Um, <coughs> And the other thing is their mass. I mean, we know that most of the effect come from the lowest mass resonance. So you would have, I, I just am worried that, you know, this resonance would have a mass of roughly four. Mm -hmm. So it's, more, it's above the psi. And, and we know that the yeah. psi is yeah, much the less. Psi. Hmm? Well, if, if I'm mistaking it, it's width to be the same as the others. Yeah. I mean, I think it's true that one would, would like, the, the problem with what you need to understand is what's the charge distribution at short distances. And uh, but the resonances which actually contribute are two, two quark resonances, and all of a sudden the six quark thing. What's interesting is that there are plenty of resonances known in other places in physics. The thing that's funny about resonances is that the what it takes to resonate is actually a fairly mild interaction, but we should. Uh, so we're going to wrap this, this up. Unusual things have to happen to explain unusual results. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is coffee. Oh, okay. We should search for coffee. Yeah, yeah, see if there is. <laughs> I'm sorry.